is Marcus Moore. He runs GPS Staffing. He is the lone minority, small-owned business that is staffing Disney movies at every level. So everybody behind the scenes that you see from your craft services to your PAs to everybody, he staffs it. Next. Slide, please. I represent social media influencers um, like Maya Elias, who will be speaking tomorrow on branding. Wallow267, who has an incredible story. If you're not following him on Instagram, he uh, it was in prison for 20 years has built an Instagram following in one year's time of over a half a million. He currently has one of the top ranked podcasts on iTunes. In the middle is Selena Watkins. She was the former Miss of Black USA 2012. She is also Women Health Magazine Next Fitness Star of 2016. Next slide, please. I also represent a, a little event called Trap Karaoke. Raise your hand if you've been to Trap Karaoke. Yes. <laughs> Trap Karaoke is a user-generated concert experience in which they buy out entire concert venues and you are the celebrity, you are the artist, and you go and you perform your favorite Trap songs. For Trap Karaoke, I've negotiated deals with Beats One and Apple Music. We then moved on from our Apple deal to Pandora. We've done collaborations with Nike, doing shows in Beijing with LeBron and currently we are on a six city tour with AT&T. So these are the types of deals that I do with my clients. Next slide, please. Um, that I do with my social influence and my entrepreneurship clients, but I also sit on the board of a little organization called the Recording Academy that puts on the Grammys. And so in my role with the Recording Academy, I co-chair advocacy in which I work and I advocate on behalf of music creators with legislators like Congressman John Lewis. Uh, this year, they passed the Music Modernization Act, which was the first substantive change to copyright law in almost 50 years. So that is a little bit of a background on the things that I do and my subset of knowledge and what I wanna pass on to you all today. Next slide. So today we will do IP Law 101, understanding how copyright and trademark are vital to your business. Two, we will talk about contracts, protecting your profits with contractor and basic services agreements. And then the last thing we're gonna do is combine the knowledge from those two skill sets and help you negotiate like a boss to get what you want. And we're gonna take some case studies of deals that I've done for my clients and give you those nuances and those tips and skills of you know what you're worth, you've built your businesses up, you know your value. So when it comes down to negotiating the deal, I want you to be equipped to get every single dollar you're worth. Next slide. So again, secure the bag with Shay. I'm at Shay M. Lawson on Twitter, on IG, and on Facebook. And so if at any time you just feel the urge to just share what's going on with your networks, tag those. Next slide. All right. Know the difference. Trademarks protect who you are. Copyrights protect what you create and contracts protect your money in the bank. Next slide. So, copyrights are completely different from trademarks. I want you to understand that completely. No matter what your business is, you likely need the protection of a copyright. Copyrights protect creative works. All of us have had logos. Raise your hand if you've had a logo made for your business. Those are actually initially protected by copyright. Your graphic designer that you paid in order to make the logo is actually the owner of the copyright of that logo until you have an agreement that says otherwise. Raise your hand if you knew that. You don't assume that because you paid a creative for their service that now you own whatever the creative made. The creative owns the work and you just paid for them. Until you actually acquire the rights to it, you do not own the videos that are made, graphic designs that are made, all of the things that are listed here, social media content, checklists, presentations, webinars, brochures, books, emails, no matter what your industry is, no matter what your business is, it is likely that if you are running a business that is profitable, that is more than a hobby, you are sending emails, that you have marketing brochures, 
all of these things are protected by copyright. So there is no point in you investing the time, energy, resources into building all these things out and to sending them out into the market for somebody else to snatch them up. Next slide, please. Understand that copyright exists from day one. So you see a lot of people and they put out something and it says copyright, Shane Lawson, 2019. The difference between just saying copyright and having the C with the circle around it means that your copyright is now registered. And sorry that the slides are off a little bit. Um, your copyright is registered. Until you register your copyright with the US Copyright Office, you have no legal standing against anyone who steals your work. So I've had clients and they provide services, their, their business, I have a client who is a business coach. I have had someone who has literally copied and pasted her entire subscriber emails, her blog posts, down to her entire website, every single page, and just replaced it with their name and picture. If you have not filed the copyright to your website, to all of your subscriber emails, to all of the content that you are sending out, you do not have legal standing in court to enforce your rights against people who steal from you. Next slide. But the good thing is that copywriting is actually one of the easiest things to do without a lawyer. There are gonna be certain things that I'm going to tell you you absolutely need a lawyer for, but copyright registration is not one. Copyright registration is anywhere from $35 to $55. Copyright.gov is one of the most user-friendly websites that you can go to to upload your work and, and um, have your registration done. So if you have a series of pictures on your Instagram, on your Facebook, if you have subscriber emails, if you have brochures, if you have books, if you have a logo, any of that, take the 30 minutes to go to copyright.gov, spend your 35 to $55 and enforce your rights. If you file your copyright within three months of publication, you are entitled to what's called statutory damages. That means that if someone infringes on your copyright, you do not have to prove that they made a single dollar from it and the court will still award you money. Take the time to register your works. There's no point in building up your brands if you're not gonna do the nuts and bolts that inherently keep the value in your brand. Next slide. So next, if copyrights protect your creative work, the actual things that you do, the foundations of your business, trademarks protect your brand. So trademarks protect your brand identifiers, what you call your products, how consumers bring you to mind. So when you see this, what company is this? And what do they provide? They are food, they're food service, correct? So a lot of people come to me and they don't understand the difference between copyright and trademark and business. They say, I need to trademark my business name. I need to copyright my business name. The trademark here is in the golden arches. People recognize the business McDonald's by the trademark golden arches. The business is McDonald's. The trademark phrase is, I'm loving it. Do you see the difference? So how people, how consumers identify your brand is going to be completely different than your business name. So if you have your business registered as an LLC, there is no other business in your state that can register under the same name as your business. So now what you wanna work on is your branding. You wanna work on your golden arches, which is how the graphic design of your logo now moves into trademark protection once consumers identify this golden M with you. So it's, it's a continuous cycle. Next, next slide, please. So you'll see here that your logo and your trademark can include your business name. So we see Starbucks coffee, 
Dinner on Blanc, right? So Dinner on Blanc, we all know, is, is an event in which there is a picnic, everybody dresses in white, but there were a series of Dinner on Blancs. When something picks up, how many seersuckers and sundresses have you been to? You know, cocktails and conversations have you been to? You cannot have a Dinner on Blanc unless you are licensed to them. If you have an event that you know is unique under a unique name, you need to have it trademarked, which again, builds the value in your brand because you can now enforce against other people in other cities or other promoters who want to do something similar to you under the same name, but now you can enforce against them. And if somebody does wanna work with you, now they need to pay a licensing fee. You're securing the bag by securing your intellectual property. Similarly, with Starbucks, their logo incorporates their company name, but without that Starbucks being there, the Starbucks woman alone, you identify her with the Starbucks name. So you want to have things, when you think about a trademark, you want to think about how do consumers identify the services that you give or the goods that you provide? What are the catchy names that you've made for your courses? What's a tagline that you use to promote yourself? What is the name of you know, your event, your product? So if Nike is the company, Air Force One is the branded product. Jordan is the branded product. Nike is the overarching company. The swoosh that you see, the Nike check that you all see, is the trademark logo that consumers identify with the brand. So understand that, that there are three distinct things here. That there is the copyright that protects your actual underlying creative work, all of the things that build your business, from your websites to your blog posts, your email lists, your actual individual designs. Your trademarks protect your actual brand itself, how consumers identify you specifically from any other realtor. We've heard from Nationwide, somebody can, so based on what we've just talked about, somebody tell me, what is Nationwide's trademark? Exactly. You know, what, what's all, does anybody know what Allstate is? Exactly. So there are certain phrases that people identify with a brand and you do not need to say anything else. You do not need to see anything else. You don't need to see the word Starbucks. You don't need to see the word Nike next to the check. You don't need to see McDonald's next to the M. So think about those elements of your brand that nothing else needs to be said or seen, but consumers automatically identify it with you and that is what you you want to get trademarked. And so a lot of times I have clients come to me and they have multiple things going. And they say, well, I have, um, I wanna do merchant, I'm a realtor, but I wanna do merchandise and I got these classes that I wanna teach people and da da da. Understand, trademarks go to a specific good or purpose. So if you have a television show, that's one trademark. If you have a clothing company, the exact same phrase, logo, that's now a second trademark you need to register. For example, Sean Puffy Combs, Diddy, however you refer to him, has about 10 trademarks for Sean John because he has one trademark for Sean John the perfume, another trademark for Sean John under entertainment, a third trademark for Sean John under clothing. For every different use of a branding element that you have, you must file a different trademark. So understand that as you're prioritizing, especially as an entrepreneur, a solo entrepreneur, what you want to spend your money on, what you want to invest on, you want to invest in the trade, protecting the trademark of the thing that's A, most likely to be stolen, and B, the thing that's generating you the most money. Next slide. Next slide. So, legal myth or fact, I have a great idea, I need to copyright it. How do I protect my ideas? Are you in the slides? No. All right, right here, I heard a bunch of, tell me your name. Sorry. Tell me your name. Uh, Danielle. 
All right, Danielle is correct. I heard a bunch of copyrights in the background. This is actually a myth. You cannot legally protect an idea. You can only protect the execution of it. How many shows do you know where there are four celebrity judges, you have people who are auditioning and performing for a chance at fame? American Idol, The Voice, The Four. I have so many people come to me angry. This person stole my idea. Oh, I got this great idea. I, I know I need to retain you because I don't want anybody to steal my idea. You cannot legally protect ideas. You can only protect the execution of it. Once that show is filmed, the filmed show is protected by copyright. Once you name that show, The Four, the name The Four is protected by trademark. Understand that you use legal protections to protect the execution of your idea. Next slide. But as Danielle told us, you can protect yourself with an NDA. Next slide. So, Again, go to the Black Enterprise app and make sure that you have these slides because these are actual segments from an, my actual NDA that I use for my clients. And so no matter what line of business you're in, and we're about to move on to segment two for contracts, you need an NDA to be a part of every basic conversation you're having, whether you are talking to investors. And so now you are talking to somebody about your idea who has the financial means to execute it without you. S stop sending your stuff out without having people send an NDA. Pro tip number one, everything is a secret. Until you sign this NDA, you, you don't need to know my business. Everything is a secret. Your ideas, your concepts, your clients, your customer and supplier information, your business plans, procedures. Stop thinking about intellectual property as just the fancy sparkly stuff, the logo, the, the Starbucks lady. It's not, it's the stuff that's putting money in your pocket. Your supplier list is. Your email list is putting money in your pocket. All of that is your intellectual property that you need to keep. Next slide. Pro tip number two, be specific about how it can be used. Recipients shall make use of my confidential information only for the purpose of filling your obligations to me as a potential independent contractor. That's it. You can't use it to build your side hustle. How many of you all still have nine to fives? How many of you, just be honest, I won't tell anybody, how many of y'all use work resources to work on your side hustle? You still use, you use your, your computer to Google stuff, you send the emails to other people, you call in on your break. People do that all the time and guess what? They will do it to you. That intern you hired, that person who you're using as free labor, they're gonna use your contacts to build their side hustle. That email list you have, everything, no. When I give you this information, you can only use it, next slide, for the purposes of me. It says, recipient will not disclose my confidential information to any third party, make or permit to be, to be made copies or reproductions of my information, except for in connection with the task. You won't make commercial use for it, academic use for it, lecture use from it. Nothing. You can't use this for anything. You leave, that's pro tip number three, leave no stone untouched. You have worked too hard. You have spent too many hours, spent too much of your own money to build your company, to build out your systems and your procedures, to build out your customer list, to build out your know-how, to have somebody take your idea, your information, the foundations of your company, and give it to a third party. I did an NDA for Beyonce, for somebody who was gonna work for Beyonce. Her NDA is honestly about 40 pages of things that you cannot do if you work for her. That's how serious she is about how she does business, how it will not go out. We don't know what Beyonce is going to do until she does it, but think about how many working parts have to be at play. 
all those kids that she got from the band, the designer she had to get to make clothes, and miraculously nothing leaks? Nothing. That should tell you how serious you should also be about not having your information disclosed. Next screen. So a non-disclosure will protect people from reusing your ideas, sharing ideas, sharing sensitive data. If you've ever done business with friends and then you were no longer friends and now you've lost your email passwords, you've lost your social media accounts, you've lost all the things that you use to build your consumer goodwill. Those are things that explicitly need to be put in writing and are best put in an NDA a confidentiality. So when you have yet to execute on your idea and you say, I have this great idea, I want to talk to a tech developer about an app that I want to build out. I have this great idea and I know that you have the money for it, but I want to talk to you about it first. First, sign this NDA. Next. If it's enough money to get mad over, you need a contract. <laughs> Point blank. I want you all to make a promise in 2019, right here in Charlotte, everybody raise your hand, raise your hand. I, I will stop, will stop doing, business doing business via text message. Via text message. All right. <laughs> stop doing handshake business. You have invested in yourself and you've come to this conference, you're getting all of this advice from all these great people. So from this day forward, handle business as business. Handle business as business. And business, we can have conversations about business via text message. We can have conversations about business via email. But when the business is done, it's done in writing, in paper. Everybody is friends until money gets involved. Next slide. So we're on to three, protecting your data and profits. So next slide. So when we talked about that NDA and those contracts, you all need to have your graphic designer sign this, the contract that A is an assignment of copyright that says, I paid you $500 on June 1st to make me a company logo. In exchange for $500, I assign you, business owner, all copyright here, now, forever existing. I'm going to repeat that one more time because that's exactly how the contract should read. <laughs> I paid you, I received $500 on June 1st, 2019 to make this logo for X, Y, and Z business. In exchange for payment, I assign to you, business owner, all legal rights, including copyrights or other rights here, now, or ever in existence. Your personal assistants, your staff, your contractors, you need to have it in writing what they're signing that NDA. You're not leaving with my contact list. You're not leaving with my passwords. You're not leaving with my supplier list. You're not going to take what I put into you as a company, all the policies, the procedures, and the systems, and then hop over and leave and go work for my competition and go use it. Because if you do, you're now in breach of this NDA, and I'm suing you and them. End of story. You secure the bag by securing your intellectual property. Next slide. So there's your work for hire. Again, if you have not downloaded the BE app, this is it. This is an actual paragraph from a, the real independent contractor form that I use. Next slide. You are only in a position to protect yourself when you set and articulate clear expectations. So we have talked about people working for you, potentially working for you, but now let's talk about your, your customers and clients. Your biggest headache is gonna be when somebody pays you and they're like, but I thought you were gonna so-and-so, but I only got this and I only so-and-so. That means that you didn't set clear expectations in the beginning. Because if this person expected this and now they're on your phone, they're in your email, well, if you look at paragraph two in bold, it told you you weren't getting that. Well, if you looked at the bottom where you click shop, there was a pop-up that told you there were no returns. You want to make expectations unmistakably clear. You want to make sure that your customers and clients have no opportunity to come back to you and say that they thought something that wasn't going to happen because those are going to be your biggest headaches. 
show it again, show it again, show it again. When you have policies like no refund, um, you must get me so-and-so information by this date, when you have those types of expectations, I say have them three places. Have it where the person buys it, have a pop-up right before the person pays for it, and have it again in the confirmation email when they receive it. So that there were three separate opportunities for you to see what you were getting into. So if you didn't see it, that's not my fault. You're not getting your money back. It's above me now. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> Any Deltas in the audience? Yes, hey, Sarah. All right, guess you guessed it, get your ducks in a row. Next slide. Your basic services agreement should tell the customer what they receive. Number two is actually most important, what they don't receive. Let's just say you're a photographer. Somebody takes you, you get your pictures. People assume you're gonna retouch, you're gonna edit, you're going to give them all of the, the rough pictures. No, but you need to be clear because people make assumptions every single day. So number two, be absolutely clear on what they don't receive. Be clear on when they will receive it. Before is more important than number three. Tell me what I need to do in order to receive it on time, because people will dilly-dally all day and then be mad when you don't get it to them on time. But it's like, ma'am, you didn't answer my email for three days and now you want it tomorrow? You need this in your client contract. But that also means that you need to walk through all the steps of your business to understand what you need from your customer. So I always tell clients if you're um, real paperwork based, have an actual place on your website or your customer list that says, this is the paperwork I need from you. This is the paperwork you need to have in order before we get started. You want to be unmistakably clear about what needs to be done before you get to me. And so when people schedule appointments with you, if people pay deposits with you, those are really great times to put your expectations. And then the last thing is, of course, securing your intellectual property. What ownership rights exist or don't exist? Just because you are paying for this, again, are there any photographers here? Anybody? Okay, just, just a few. But understanding, you can use this. I had, actually, the headshot that I used for Black Enterprise, I had a friend shoot it for me, and it was just a general headshot. It has now been in a print publication. That is not what was anticipated at the time that we did the shoot. I just, out of being an intellectual attorney, turned around and paid him more because I'm like, now this is being used commercially. You want to understand and tell people what rights they have. Because you took my online course does not mean that you can share your password with your friend and they can get access to it too. Just because you came here and you enjoyed it, I've had somebody sit in a webinar that they paid a pretty penny for and then go and regurgitate it via a blog post. You're selling yourself short because you pay for this information and now you're giving it to somebody for free and you're definitely not gonna sell me short. So understand what ownership rights exist or don't exist, and a lot of times we're glossing over that. And guess where they are every day on the internet where you can see really great examples that you can copy and paste? In terms of service and terms of use. Every single website at the bottom has a terms of service and a terms of use. And that tells you what rights you have and don't have and how you can use the information. And that really is governing and protecting your copyright. So understand that. Next, last negotiation. I know we're running out of time. She's about to hit me with the wrap up. All right, last, getting what you want and deserve. Next slide. When you provide true value, you are not being petty over pennies. You are getting what you are worth. Understand that. Next slide. So negotiation, anybody who talks to people, people who like to, I like to get my way. People who really don't like to, I don't like to argue. Just because I'm a lawyer, people assume I like to argue. No, 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 I get paid to argue. People who aren't playing about what they want and know what they deserve. Next slide. This is somebody who didn't want to pay me my price. Raise your hand if you ever told somebody your price for your service and they didn't want to pay you. Here's a neat, this is an actual email, and I blacked out the names for the protection of the innocent. 
And this is like way back yonder day when I was only charging $250 an hour. So I'm like, hey, you know, this $250 an hour is for 10 hours of time. Hey, I'm telling you what you're getting. Here's the value. I'm legitimizing your concerns. Second paragraph. I know embarking on legal action can be scary. I, I understand that this is a lot of money. However, if your case settles, you will have paid $2,500 to get $55,000 back. So I want you to understand the value you're getting with me. Here's some resources you might find helpful to understand why I charge what I charge. Here's an invoice that explains why I'm not charging you hourly. Here's a second report that shows that my fee is $57 less than the national average. If you don't understand why you're charging what you're charging, you won't be able to come up with this email. This person paid the retainer five minutes after this email got sent over. <laughs> Because they understood their value, I didn't diminish their concern, I made them comfortable with realizing the value they are getting. You can only do that when you've done this background work that I'm telling you about where I said you need to walk all the way through the process because that's how you get the clear client services agreement and now you have your clarity to enter into a negotiation like a boss. Next slide. Here's somebody who wanted to play my client. They sent us a deck and asked my client to do a commercial for their brand. Cool. But then when it came down to us signing the paperwork, they were like, oh, we need these social media posts from her too. Guess what? That's gonna cost you more. So I say, hey, look, this isn't here. This needs to be, this needs to be specified. I said, if you guys want something like that, her, the third bullet point, the blog post and the social content is gonna increase the rate to 3,500. I said, let me know if you wanna hop on a call. They, they emailed me back and basically were like, nah. Slide, next slide. <laughs> I said, let me go ahead and hit you with these receipts. I've attached the original proposal in which you told me you were giving me this for a commercial loan and you wanted to see if she was open to social content. She's definitely willing to do this thing you originally asked, but I know my value. I'm not being a diva. I'm not being petty. You're not getting this content for free. Based on these conversations and the, regarding additional budget, we can provide this discount. I say, look, for $1,000, which is a significant discount on her current fee, I normally charge you this, but I'll do this for this amount, but please don't mistake, I know my value. They cut the check. Understand, next slide. Understand the magic equation. When you can fill out these three things with ease, that means you've walked through all your business processes and now you can walk into a negotiation. I blank, when I blank, 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 blank. My typical audience is this. So in this thing, she was a lifestyle blogger. When she posts blog posts, typically over a thousand people convert to the next step, whether it's purchasing, going to a website. My typical audience member is a mother in a household of 100,000. And plus. So now I can tell you why this blog post cost $1,000. Because I know that 1,000 people who have a household income of over six figures are going to see your product and buy it. Cut the check. <laughs> Next slide. So in order to negotiate with power, you need to understand what do you want, why do you want it? You cannot just be a diva. You need to understand why you're pricing, why your numbers are like that, and you can only do it when you filled out the magic equation. You can only fill out the magic equation when you've done your processes. Determine your audience, time considerations, manage your emotions. That was when I said, I understand this can be scary. Just because you are negotiating and you know you're about to get what you want doesn't mean that you need to approach it like, oh, uh, come up off them dollars. Like, you don't have to do that. What does your grandmother say? You catch more flies with honey than what? You garner allies, realize what's nice to have, and realize your bottom line. When you walk all the way through your processes and your procedures and you know how much it costs for you to run your business, you know sometimes this just isn't worth it and I'm going to walk away. And even and you sometimes the clients that you knew in your mind you should have walked away from, those are the most night raise your hand if you had a nightmare client that you knew it, you knew you should have said no. You do it ahead of time when you're clear what your bottom line is. So those are all of my tips. That's it. Next slide. 
Again, I've completely run out of time. I'm sorry, I ran my mouth. Secure the bag with Shay is the hashtag. If you have questions, how much time can I have for Q&A? Five minutes, okay. Does anybody have questions? Come to the mic, their mic's right here. Hi, I'm Aj Cunningham with 100 Black Men. Could you talk a little about the distinction between an NDA and an intellectual property rights agreement, how they work hand in hand? Uh, they, work, they work hand in hand. So an NDA is literally a non-disclosure. I am going to disclose information to you in exchange for you receiving this knowledge. You will not tell anybody. You will not use it. But if you have an intellectual property rights agreement, now this agreement is saying, you. but you may use it to build this app. You may use it to do your job, but you may not use it for this. So sometimes they go hand in hand when you move to the next step. Over here. Hi, quick question. Um, first is, when you have something that's a term that's kind of like a, let's say, team melanin that people have already been using, mm -hmm. how do you end up protecting your use of that when you have a certain logo that goes with it? Second thing is, if you've created a word, how do you handle protecting that in a way? So if you say you've created a word that you want others to use, but you just want to be able to get acknowledged for can it. Can you tell us the word and how you're using it? Uh, if you have, I have an NDA, you can sign it. Do it. All right, well, you know, the, the email me, but. Okay. So, no. but to answer your first question, you cannot. The trade, the number one question that the trademark office is going to ask is how can you prove that you are the original source of this word, this good? If it is a widely used phrase, you must do things that are unique and fanciful is what the trademark office says. So that is not unique and fanciful because it is being widely used and it cannot be identified down to one source. So when you are trying to trademark something, understand that um, you must have set yourself up to acquire distinctiveness in the market as the loan source of it. Over here. Hello, hello. Okay, hello, Sora Lance. Hey, Sora. Um, so how do trademarks, if it does, does it extend to jingles or songs? So like if I was trying to do a song for my <laughs> podcast or whatever, how does that work? So the actual song itself would actually be um, protected by copyright. Okay. So um, there's a, actually a really good interview out right now with like Pusha T. A lot of people don't know that Pusha T did the da 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 da. I'm, Pusha T did that, but he did it as a work for hire, and owns no rights to it. And so, however, if something is um, known for you, so if you are a music producer and um, it's like DJ Mustard on the beat. That's called a sound mark. And you file a sound mark with the trademark office because that sound is the trademark of you. So the guy who does the boxing and he's like, let's get ready to rumble. He has that sound mark. He owns that. So, that, so if you have a specific sound that consumers only identify with you, then you file what's called a sound mark. And are you allowed to say it? So like, can you sing the nationwide is on your side? Like, are you allowed to sing that or is it sound mark? Do you have to just say it? Uh, no, 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 it needs to be the exact sound. Let's get ready to rumble is said a very specific way. It needs mm -hmm. to be the actual sound. They will ask you in the application to submit the waveform. Okay. F I mean, wave file. Okay, thank you. This side. Um, good afternoon. I wanted to find out, um, do you represent clients when it comes to issues with like a GoDaddy domain that's been stolen and it's unique to that person's name and somehow someone else has taken it and they don't have any connection with the name? Oh, no, 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 that's, that's big business. There's no way, I'm, <laughs> and I hate to phrase it that way, but that's big business. People purposely squat on domains all the time purely for the point of they know that you are going to get it. So when you do come up, that's a very good question, thank you for asking it. When you do come up with a business name or something like that, one of the first things you need to do is check to see if the digital real estate is available. See if the domain, the Twitter, the Facebook, because it does you no good to come up with this great company name and now it's owned you know, by somebody else. I had a client who um, owned a, a domain and it was called Social IQ. These guys then decided, some guys like in another country decided they they wanted to uh, make an app called Social IQ. They paid six figures for this domain that my client had paid 12 bucks for on GoDaddy, so. Okay, it's not that particular question. It's mainly if you already had it established and someone literally has taken it somehow deceptively oh. through GoDaddy. 
like a hacker? No, I don't, and I'm not quite sure. I don't want to speak out of turn. That's, that's purely a hacking scenario, and I'm not quite sure. That would probably be like a cybersecurity attorney. Okay. Yeah, I would look into somebody who does cybersecurity. All right, thank you. Thank you. Is there, she's the last? These two, okay. I have a question as a vlogger. Do you have to trademark every video that you do? No, it's copyright, I mean, and it's copyright, yeah. good question too. So if you are a blogger and you're, uh, I always tell my clients that blog that you can file things with the copyright office as a series or a collection. And so you might want to wait and maybe just file copyright 2017 blogger Shay volume one, 2019 volume two. So maybe I, I tell my clients to actually um, file their copyrights every quarter so that it can hit that three month mark I told you about with the statutory damages so just file your copyright every quarter for fall you know the fall series of your blog post the winter series X Y and Z I do the same with the videos not the terminology of retroactive for co copyright uh, lawsuits but what kind of what kind of term do you have to uh, file a lawsuit um, based on uh, the theft of a, uh, a copyright so you, so copyright. you I, let me make sure that I'm hearing you correctly that you you have something that was maybe stolen five years ago and you never enforced it and now you want to see if you can enforce it like what's the statute of limitations on filing a copyright suit you can always go back and get your coins like people can't just steal and get away with it so um but the catch is is that you you need to file your copyright registration you cannot file a case in court the judge will send you back and dismiss you in order for you to file your registration and the registration needs to be complete it used to be that you could just have an application your registration needs to be complete before you have standing so file your copyright and then you can go back and file the case and and it's based on discovery and if you don't have a copyright, can, can there be proof? Can you provide proof, evidence uh, to the case? Your copyright exists from the day you publish it. Your rights to enforce do not begin until you register it. So when you register it, they will ask you what day was it published. Okay. All right. Thank you, thank you everybody so much. Give it up for Shay. Shout out to me at Shay M. Lawson.